Uh, my name is Ed Mags uh, of Mags Brothers. I'm a bookseller and uh, Mags Brothers has worked from this wonderful building for um, only about five years now. We moved from a flat fronted three window Georgian building in a leafy London square to a flat fronted three window uh, Georgian building uh, in an even better um, leafy square. Um, I don't know how we coped in the previous building, which was only grade two listed uh, with our grade one. Uh, but more important than that, we've moved from Mayfair, uh, which is a fabulously wealthy, uh, but is, is the home of money, basically, and coming over to Bloomsbury, mm -hmm. which is the home, uh, basically, of learning and of books in England. Um, right from the start, we were moved uh, with the, uh, the, the types of people our neighbours were, um, both in the worlds of education and, and libraries and publishing and so on. And then we made a, a discovery at about the same time that the founder of the firm, um, in, 18, in the early 1850s, by 1853 he was established, was um, a youngish man called Uriah Maggs, who had come from Somerset, from Midsummer Norton in Somerset. All the Maggses come from this, um, around the, 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 the coal belt of Somerset. And what we didn't know, it had been erased from oral history, um, which in my experience isn't worth the paper they didn't write it down on uh, because it is so selective. And so now, of course, I'm proud that my great-great-grandfather was a footman. He was in domestic service. And within five generations, I own my own car, you know, and a house. It's all on my own bootstraps. But he was at 38 Gower Street in service to an interesting medical doctor, a man called Barnard Van Ovens, who played quite an important role in the campaign for Jewish um, 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 representation. He, he was um, in, in, in Parliament and so on. And that was 1851. He was in the census there. And I, I, I had have quite a sort of an advanced, um, not quite erotic fantasy, but, but a fantasy nonetheless of this um, striding, earnest young man who was, in his photos, when young, looked straight out of Samuel Smiles, full of self-improvement, full of hard work, an honest shopkeeper, um, you know, a very Napoleonic character in, in that way. And of him striding out on an errand up into town, up to Covent Garden, uh, maybe, and simultaneously trying to catch the eye and trying not to catch the eye of the blue stocking um, young women attending Bedford College, uh, realising that they were probably a cut above him. Uh, but nevertheless, the chance that he might have, they had been walking on the same pavement uh, at any rate as Kate Dickens and, and the others. Um, but anyway, uh, we think the building probably looks better now than it did at any time uh, since, um, since Bedford College, uh, largely thanks to um, Rolf Kentish, uh, whose wife Frances is a Bedford alumni and who is here and he's the, I made what should have been a terrible mistake of working with a friend as an architect on a, on a complicated project. And it's great tribute to Rolf that he was a, his subtlety and his ability to deal with a massively conflicting and conflicted grief. And he just kept rolling with it and kept, kept going. It was, it was a triumph and, and we're, we couldn't be happier with the building and, and with its historic um, um, connections. And um, that's it. Um, I, sh I should pin passes as uh, rare booksellers, which are tremendously good. We've got about 20 specialists. Uh, we do everything from medieval manuscripts to science fiction. We cover all the world from the west of Ireland uh, to Kyoto, um, almost every subject. We've got some absolutely super people working here. And it's, um, it's a wonderful, odd old firm. And, yeah. and welcome. So, Caroline, over, um, over to you. Claire next. Claire, <laughs> over to you. But yeah. I need to give you that. Um, so thank you very much everyone for coming here today and this is the first in our three celebratory events for the 175th anniversary and it's really good to see a large number both here and online and uh, today we will be talking about this building and uh, buildings associated with it um, and I think we are going to be seeing some images from the archives uh, and talking about the people who founded the college. Um, and before we get going with our talk, I would like to pay tribute to the members of the alumni and development office team of the college who've been so supportive to us in making it possible to put this event on. And of course, to, to Mike's brothers, and we'll hear more later. And also to thank uh, Julie Saunders, the college uh, 
principal, vice chancellor, as it is now, and uh, Ruth Livesey, who's here as well. And Ruth has been uh, very instrumental in helping us to prepare for the Regent's Park event in July. Um, so with all that, I think we can start our talk. We have the first slide. Yeah. Right. David? Or well, the second slide then. Yeah. <laughs> this is, <clears throat> as you can see, uh, sorry, I'm Caroline Barron, and actually I'm a medieval historian masquerading at the moment as a 19th century historian. And Ruth will know just where I, where the gaps are. But it's actually, the Vic if I hadn't been a medieval historian, I think a Victorian, a 19th century historian would be what I would have chosen. Second best. Now, <laughs> here we have um, the building that we're now in. If, do you not think it's fascinating to think we're in the room where Elizabeth Jessa Reed, the founder of the college, would also have stood? I find that quite moving to think about it. I guess it's better decorated and with more books than it had in her day, but we'll come on to that. So here we have this picture, this photograph was probably taken in about 1912, something like that. I don't know if Ed knows exactly when that was taken, but um, it looks rather dreary compared with the way it looks now and also rather dirty. And you remember London was very dirty. The buildings were very dirty. Probably were, many of you were students, the buildings were dirty. And the Clean Air Act in 1952 really made a huge difference. And it all looks much brighter and sharper than it did when, uh, well, when this photograph was taken. And the next slide, thank you, shows, now this comes from, not from our own archives, but from the estates of Woburn Abbey, the Duke of Bedford's estates. And this is the original lease of this property, to the head lease of this property, uh, which uh, went to a man called Robert Grews, who actually sublet it. And uh, here we have, this is Bedford Square here. This is the house. This, so to speak, is the bay window behind us here. And this <clears throat> large area here is not developed. It was uh, just a garden. And you'll see, I will show you towards the end, a couple of slides to show you how the site was built up in the course of the next period. Now, why did... Uh, Elizabeth Jessa Reed choose to set up her college here in Bloomsbury because actually Maribyrn was more fashionable, um, I'm afraid to say, and more fashionable than slightly north, further north, and it had the park nearby. Uh, but I think it was deemed to be better to found the college here because it was nearer to University College, which had been founded in Gower Street. Uh, just a few years before. And at the early days, she depended upon the professors from University College to come and teach in her new college. So this, uh, I'm citing here the words of Andrew Byrne, who wrote a book about Bedford Square, and he said that Bloomsbury was an upper middle class suburb. It was to be the home, and the Bedford estate developed it, not, I quote, of an indolent aristocracy, but for the aristocracy of the city and the inns of court. And the first people who leased these properties were in fact often uh, solicitors, lawyers, judges, uh, actually doctors as well, and city merchants, not tradesmen, you understand, but <laughs> merchants who traded. So uh, this is how it was developed. And probably much as it was when Elizabeth Jessa Reed took it over or took up these, we'll come on to that in the, well, it would be over 100, uh, over 50 years later. So over to you, Claire. Yeah. Um, so today we're talking mainly about the building, um, but I do want to say a few words about Jessa Reed and her background, and also the background of Bloomsbury. So. She was born in 1789, so by the time of this letter, she was 43. Um, and she'd been married uh, very briefly. Uh, she married John Reed in 1821. She was already in her 30s, and he died the following year. So by this period, she'd been a widow for some time. Um, she was born into a Unitarian family and surrounded by Unitarian friends uh, and family, and was 
also living in Bloomsbury at this time. She was living in Gravel Street, which is over close to Great Ormond Street Hospital. Um, and this was just a few years after the founding of University College on Gower Street. And I think we really, we can't emphasize enough the importance to Elizabeth Reed, Jessa Reed, of the founding of University College, partly because of the difference that it made to Bloomsbury, because of the nature of the college. It was a college of uh, without um, religious affiliation, unlike Oxford and Cambridge. It was a college that was open to those who were not members of the Church of England and didn't have any faith at all. Um, it had a very wide range of subjects, much wider range of subjects taught than Oxford and Cambridge. Um, and it was attracting attention worldwide and in fact globally. And it had a presence. It had a, it was, had a large building. It was extending its estate. And it was a really important part of the boom. And here, um, the student, a medical student, is describing his first impressions of uh, Mrs. Reed. And you will see that he says that she was actively benevolent and high-minded. And then if we go on to the next slide, please, David. He describes her as well-informed, intelligent, refined, delicate. Now, she wasn't um, intellectual. She didn't have a formal education as we understand it today. She was educated at home, but in a family that valued education and in a circle of friends that valued education. And she herself, from this time onwards, until she founded the college in 1849, was part of the Bloomsbury Circle that extended outwards from University College. She was particularly close to Henry Crabb Robinson, um, who by training was a lawyer, but also a, a writer, a diarist, and who was one of the founders of UCL. And uh, just one of life's networkers had very, very good connections and who included her in his circle. And she was building up um, her, her, her circle, her network, which, was allow which allowed her in due course to found Bedford College at Bedford College and in that circle, education, liberal values, uh, the disestablishment of the church, anti-slavery, all these liberal causes were important. And of course, for Jessa Reed, the importance for women of access to higher education. <clears throat> right, next one, thanks. So she had this circle of friends. It's worth remembering that by the time she actually, her idea came into came to fruition in 1849. Elizabeth Jessel Reed was 60 years old. And that's quite interesting that she carried this dream, as it were, and finally managed to bring it to pass. Now, this is the deed of trust, which actually is set up just, they hadn't yet actually found premises, but she set up this deed that the college actually opened in the autumn of that year. And it's, this is, we have the text of the deed in the archives. I should say that most of what Claire and I are talking about comes from the Bedford archives, which are kept at Royal Holloway and are really fun and exciting to use, but they could do with a touch of organization. But anyway, um, that this deed is there and that she had to have three trustees. Now, the interesting thing is, is the three trustees that she had at this point were all men. Uh, she had a, this is the thing about she was very good at collecting in not only women friends who helped her, but men friends as well, the sort of people that Claire was talking about. So her three trustees were a man called Hensley Wedgwood, who um, was a philologist and a, a cultured man, and Alec Crabb Robinson, that sort of man, who uh, at first chaired the committee, which sort of organized the college in its very earliest year. Um, Erasmus Darwin, the brother of Charles Darwin, who was involved with the new college and had the longest connection with the college, actually, of, of these three. And the third person was a lawyer called Thomas Henry Farrer. Farrer and co are a firm of, famous firm of lawyers who are still operating. He was a young man. He was born in 1819, and he was to have a very distinguished legal career. So she had these three people to act as the trustees 
and she provided a thousand pounds. And I think it's we can't overestimate how crucial the money that Elizabeth Jessa Reed put into the founding of the college, not just at the beginning, but when it looked as if it might fold, she put in more money and she left it, the money to uh, her estate. Because she was a widow, she didn't remarry, so she kept hold of her money. She inherited from her father as well as from her husband. Now, these three men are not the most famous men of the intellectual world of the 19th century, but they were a, a great collection of people who are high-minded and well-intentioned. And according, um, uh, to, you know, the, the, bugs, the, sorry, the history of Bedford College written by Marian Tuke says, these three men belong to a circle distinguished by its disinterested desire for the public good, its sobriety of outlook, and its solid culture. That was the, these were the men who supported her in the founding of her college. But they still had to find premises. I mean, they must have been looking around. Originally, uh, Elizabeth Jessery wanted it to be further um, east, but uh, it was then thought that the professors from University College wouldn't be keen to walk that far, and it was better to have it somewhere in Bloomsbury, so she did that. Uh, and um, the lease seems at first to have been taken by another of the male supporters of Elizabeth Jessa Reed, who was a man called um, the Reverend Dr. James Booth, who was um, a professor of physical geography and of mathematics. Interesting how you can combine things, isn't it? <laughs> and he chaired the council for a time, and he was another of these worthy male supporters. So the first lease was to him, and then it moves on. Can we have the next slide, please? To um, uh, the actual ladies' college. It was called the ladies' college at first. It acquired the name Bedford College a few years later. So um, this is, uh, you can see 1855, so it's a bit later, renewing the lease. Um, it's worth remembering that the college had great difficulties when it started off. The, it, the first uh, enrollment was 68 students. But, you know, it's not like nowadays where you enroll for three years. They'd enroll for a course or a short term of, of talks or something. So they weren't. And actually, a lot of the early students were Elizabeth Jessa Reed's friends, um, as supporters. It would be like me getting Claire to come to my class, you know, because she's a, a key a friend and a supporter. So a lot of them came to classes in order to support her in her new venture. It's quite interesting. And most of the talks are the teachers were the professors, mostly from okay. University College. Um, among the early students was a woman called uh, Marion Evans, who was better known to us as George Eliot, who was, uh, took a co two courses here in 1850 to 51, cl classes in math and in Latin. So that's quite interesting. Um, and this, you see here, says this note was sent to Mr. Le Breton on the 26th of February, confirming it. And he was a member of the council, another of these worthy men supporting this enterprise at its beginning. Okay, Claire? Yes, go next slide, please. Um, so, whereas well, in 1855, still in 1855, and Mrs. Reed writes, for we all love the very walls of number 47 and should exchange for another house, mille or mille regrets. And the lease was renewed uh, for a thousand pounds in 1855. I think we've put this slide here um, because it gives you a sense of the importance to the College of Place, the importance of the building and the importance of having a place, having a home. Um, and having a home here in Bedford Square, which as Caroline mentioned um, earlier on in the talk, was part of the Bedford Estate and was one of the jewels in the crown of the Bedford Estate. When it was first built, it was one of the, the, the most attractive parts of Bloomsbury. Um, and I think there's a sense of achievement in um, having the building, being able to afford the building and being able to say that this is the home of the college, still called the Ladies' College at this time, and being in a, a position to renew the lease, to have the funds to renew the lease um, in 1855. And uh, just to emphasize Caroline's point that the college struggled in its early years. Uh, much of the time that it was here and, and money was important and where the next tranche of money was coming from was important and of course Jessa Reed was uh, absolutely crucial in mm. that, that the, the decision to found the college the decision 
to take a building, to take the risk of taking a building was very important. Next slide. Um, and, and on the same theme of money, I mean, they, they, took, the they took the lease, they um, decided that they were going to, to keep this house 47 as, uh, as next door um, as it was then. And then the numbers changed, didn't yes. they? It was 47 became 48, 48 became 49. And, and the college did acquire 48, um, which is where we're sitting in due course. Um, but you can see from this letter, um, that uh, repairs are needed. It wasn't just sufficient to have the funds to take the lease. There was a need for funds to repair the building. But interestingly, the letter says that the £150 is needed not to fit it for use as a gentleman's residence, as many of the buildings around the square would have been, but uh, just enough uh, <laughs> to fit it for, the, for use as a college. And, and we know from other letters in the collection that it was actually quite a spartan place to be in. Um, and I think it, it also uh, makes the point that um, many of the houses in the square were residences, were gentlemen's residences. And at first, the Bedford estate were rather reluctant to give permission for a college. They didn't want it to become commercial at this point. So, as a, some sort of toing and froing with the estate to allow the college to set up what the estate, the Bedford estate considered to be, or the Duke of Bedford's estate considered to be a, a commercial enterprise. So it would have looked rather splendid, but perhaps not so splendid inside and clearly in need of repairs. And in fact, it required the Duke of Bedford himself to intervene to allow them to renew the lease. The, his agent thought that it was a bit down market to have a ladies college here, but the Duke said it was okay. But that's how they got the renewed lease. Yeah. We have the next one. <clears throat> right. So this um, is that they acquired the building next door. So they acquired, so they expanded uh, and they bought, bought the building next door. They took over the lease of next door, um, which is now number 49. And the reason for that is that they had actually started a school as well as the college. So there was a school from 1853. There was a school partly because they, they found that a lot of the girls who came to go to the courses were not sufficiently educated. And so they felt the need to have a school to help bring girls up to the standard required to go to listen to the talks and lectures and courses from the professors at University College. And it's worth remembering how few schools there were for girls that brought them up to that kind of standard. There was Queen's College in Harley Street. Uh, and there was also in after 18, I think it was 1872, the Girls Public Day School Trust was founded and all those schools were founded and which did train girls to be ready for university education. So, um, and actually I went to the North London Collegiate School, which was founded in 1850 by Francis Mary Bath. And that also prided itself on being after Queen's College Harris, the first proper school for girls which trained them. So the, they started a school and the school, they needed therefore more space. And also um, they set up, Eliza, else, Jessa Reed set up a trust, a new trust in which she gave money. And that trust had three women. So she'd moved from a, a trust where the three men, the original, to three women. Uh, and actually, that was really important to the success of the college. She set it up. She herself died in 1866. The, the college had a bit of a crisis in the years following her death. She left her estate to be administered by the trust. It was a rocky period, she, but she left 16, her estate was 16,000 pounds, which in those days brought in 800 pounds a year which is quite significant. And there were three uh, new trustees and they took control for a time and uh, brought in a new constitution for the, for the college and it was incorporated. And they then decided to get rid of the school because the school had served its purpose. So there's a very crucial period in the late 1860s for the, in the life of, of the college. So should we go on to the next one? Oh, I should have said, sorry, that they built a, 
a passageway between the two houses so that they could get to the house next door. No necessary planning permission for that. Uh, I can remember when we had two, two Gower Street and 11 Bedford Square, we were not allowed to build any sort of link between the two. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Was in fact a deliberately planned uh, cupboard made to feel that they, they had these blind doors to make the houses uh, seem wider. Yeah, interesting, but that obviously they didn't bother to ask the Bedford estate whether they could make the passageway through, they just knocked it through. But anyway, so the, and they also, the, Claire. Um, so uh, on the previous slide, uh, the, the letter is talking about, yes, thank you. Previous slide, the letter is talking about the disposition of space. And you can see, interestingly, that there's a drawing classroom because they were teaching drawing. Um, in the school, and two classrooms, um, and then opening up communication between numbers 47 and 48. But the two institutions, the school and the college, were going on side by side, but separately. So space planning between the two buildings was important. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, and it continued. Um, and the correspondence is quite interesting about the disposition of space. And, and you can see that um, number 48 was for the school, except for the front parlor on the ground floor, which was to be used as the college library. Very important. The college library features quite significantly um, in this part of the correspondence, as indeed it should. Um, and it's an it's interesting for, for me, anyway, if you, uh, probably most of you here have looked at the photographs that um, the uh, alumni kindly set out for us over in 11 Bed Square. And you'll see some wonderful photographs of the library as we knew it in um, Regent's Park. But there's a, a rather lovely photograph and we think that was in um, York, York Place. So we're going to talk about York Place at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the talk because it was where York Place, uh, it was where Bedford College went when it left here in 1874. So the library is important at this early stage of the college. And um, here, it, 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 another mention of Eliza Bostock. And Caroline's referred to the three women trustees, Eliza Bostock, Jane Martineau, and Eleanor Smith. Um, and uh, Eliza Bostock um, played a crucial role in the early days of the college. She, she was very good at arranging things. She was obviously very practical. And um, when they're setting up um, the two houses and dividing the space in the two houses, there's a, quite a, a collection of letters about that. And this one makes clear that she's um, involved in making sure that the spaces work for the courses, the classes that were to be taught. And again, she mentions the library. The library's been painted and looks very nice, only now requiring books. Um, so Piggy and, Mags weren't there then. <laughs> yes. Um, and, and I think that um, we'll, we'll come on to this in, in, in the next slide, but one thing that's important as well is that they, um, there were very few people, there were people coming in and out all the time, students coming in and out for courses with their chaperones, the lady visitors, but the people who actually did the work were very few and Mrs. Reed and her helpers, who were by and large mostly women. And I think that's the, the attention to detail is important. Next slide. And yes, as, <laughs> am I doing this one? Yeah. yeah okay. <clears throat> yes, Miss Bostock again, she clearly was really, she was one of the three trustees of uh, which, and they all, as I said, they all had to be women, the three trustees, and also, uh, she uh, specified, Elizabeth Jessa Reed specified, that they were not to be married. And the reason for that was because that until the Married Women's Property Act, if you were married, your property was your husband. So she said they had to be unmarried and they had to be women. Right? Quite right? Yes, okay. Right. Got a lawyer here. So, I'm going to to <laughs> yeah, so Elizabeth Bostock, who was younger, obviously, than Mrs. Reed, uh, she was born in 1817, and she took classes in the college at the beginning, and from that sort of graduated into being one of the administrative helpers. She was a great supporter of women's suffrage. She wanted, I, I thought it's interesting, she wanted women, I quote, to enjoy, enjoy the right to work, to labor, 
and to earn independence. I thought that was really sort of crucial mm. in what, what this was about. She was the administrator. She wasn't paid. She had some income of her own. Uh, and she bought old furniture, as you can see. And, uh, but she was a really important member of this, one of the three trustees. Um, and she was one of the people who brought about the significant changes after Elizabeth Jessarid's death. Then there was Jane Martineau, and Claire, who attended, also attended classes at the college and uh, was the, a secretary, acted as the secretary of the college and really the sort of financial administrator. She kept apparently very good accounts and they're still in the archives and are very neat and tidy. Uh, and she devoted her life to the cause of women's education in various ways. Was she the sister of Harriet Martin? She was the sister of Harriet Martin. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Claire's going to say something about Harriet. And then there was Eleanor Elizabeth Smith, who was basically based in Oxford, who was the sister of, uh, what was he called? Henry Smith, that's right, who was the civilian professor of geometry at Oxford and very, they lived together. But she was very instrumental in helping to found Somerville College in Oxford and the Oxford High School, the Girls' Public Day School Trust. But she was also, and she was somebody who campaigned to have the Oxford degrees open to women, which didn't ha actually happen until 1927. So these were the three women that uh, Mrs. Reed chose to be the trustees, and they really were crucial in the success of the college in the next phase of its life. So, and this is the library. I think you were supposed to talk about the library. Claire. <laughs> <laughs> um, should we have a next slide? Yeah. Yes, there's a yes, more. I think, um, <laughs> you can see we're obsessed with the library. Yeah. Um, well, well, no, interestingly, I think it's very, I think it's really, it, it's interesting that uh, Vostok is obsessed with the library, and quite right too. I mean, the library, yes. you know, if you're a serious um, place of education and learning, you ought to be obsessed with the library. And you, we all know that, you know, it was Bedford College for women, Westfield College for ladies, Ron Holloway for girls, and we were the one for women. And we were, it was a serious place of learning. Um, and I think the fact that they want to make it an attractive place and an intensive, uh, in, in, an intense intensive to study. And I think that's what they were trying to do. Um, and, and just to go back to my earlier point, I think that the library in our when college when we were there was it was a good place to be. And it, it, if you're if you have a chance to go back, if you are able to uh, come to the Regents event, Regents College event, you'll see that um, the current institution has kept it more or less as it was in our day. Um, and I think that, uh, again, she, the the bookcases have been installed and paid for. Uh, paid for by Miss Bostock. We don't, we don't know whether she was paying for or from the college funds, but there's a sense of sort of slight sense of struggle, even with Jessa Reed's money in these early days. I would just say that I was in the Royal Holloway in Bedford New College Library last week. I thought that was a very nice building as well and a yeah. very nice place to work in. I was quite envious watching those people working. Anyway, yeah. okay, on you. Um, no, I, I, I agree. I think the new library is a triumph, actually, and I think it's really good that the college has put funds into the new library, not just the building itself, but the location within the college campus. The current college campus is really good. Um, so this is this is me. Yes. Um, 1864, just two years before Mrs. Reed's death. Um, and Bedford College has come of age. It is now no longer the ladies college. It, it had three or four names, didn't yes, it, during the first few, several that, years? Yeah. Three or four names <laughs> usually associated with ladies. And now it's Bedford College. And there probably were earlier versions of the headed paper, but this is the one that we found and we decided to use. And um, it, so it's established. Um, and even apart from the struggles, and it's established and established. Uh, Courses are running and largely taught by professors from uh, University College, but nothing wrong with that. Um, they got the best. Um, and it was, um, we then, uh, by the time um, the University of London was offering degrees for women in the 1878, Bedford College, students from Bedford College were some of the very first to get degrees and to, uh, to even do very well in their, in their degrees. So I think the relationship between UCL and Bedford was strong right from the beginning. 
Um, three Bedford students got first class degrees in that first in that first cohort. Year. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I'm Harriet. So yes. So, so here, um, apart from the headed paper, the, and the interest in this letter is that um, Elizabeth Bostock is talk, writing to Mrs. Reed about an article by Harriet Martineau. Now, the Martineau family, of course, uh, famous for um, their uh, work in um, radical causes, but also in education. And James Martineau, Harriet's younger brother, was a professor at uh, University College. Um, and I think Harriet herself, um, writer, thinker, uh, polemicist in many ways, actually, for, for a woman really not afraid to express her opinions, again, from a Unitarian family uh, like the Reeds um, and the Bostocks. Um, but uh, uh, eventually, later in life, uh, left behind her all forms of religion and was openly agnostic. And, and that was quite, in those days, that was uh, quite courageous to, to, to have, to express publicly uh, those views. Um, but here she's writing about the education of girls in the Cornhill magazine, which was a, a periodical widely read in those days by the, um, the circle in which um, Mrs. Reed would have uh, moved. And I think that it shows the, uh, the circle of friends, the circle of the network in, uh, in which um, Bedford College moved, not just the male network from University College, but also the network that the, the women of Bedford College were building up and, um, and the, uh, the, import, the causes, the, um, uh, the issues that were important to them. Now, <clears throat> we're back again. This is the least, uh, unfortunately, for some reason, the Bedford Estate has the head leases, the 1777 and now this one, 1875, nearly 100 years later, doesn't seem to have the subsidiary leases. So we haven't got copies of the leases. Or I, we, I haven't been able, I went to Woburn, I've been to uh, the London Metropolitan Archives, can't find the subsidiary leases. Um, however, so by this date, Bedford has left the site. They left in uh, 1874, is that right? Yeah. And they moved to York Place in Marylebone. But I wanted to show you this partly because this is, as it were, after Bedford has left, you can see a certain amount that there has been development in that the yard, this has been built up, this corridor here, and they've built up where the stables were at the uh, southern end. So this is the original site, and it's been filled in to some extent. So it's an open yard, no longer a garden. But <clears throat> it's interesting that they have moved out, they've moved to Mount, they decided not to renew the lease, uh, um, for another period in Bedford Square. Um, they moved to Marylebone in part, I think, because Bloomsbury was changing. It wasn't any longer so much the home for solicitors and merchants and so on. It was becoming commercial premises. And the reason, there are various reasons for that. Marylebone was more salubrious. It was more likely to be where people who were going to come to the college would live because this area was becoming less uh, uh, a domestic area, a more commercial area. And uh, it was, it was, I was interested that apparently this area until 1893 was still gated. You still had toll gates and came in, unless, you, know, you had to have business in here to come. And in 1893, the LCC, the newly established LCC London County Council, also, was authorized to remove the remaining gates from the Bedford Estate. And I read in, <clears throat> the effect of their removal must not be understated, for it changed Bloomsbury from a secluded, almost private neighborhood into a busy thoroughfare for all West End traffic. On its way to and from much of North London and the three great railway termini of Euston, St. Pancras and King's Cross. So in a sense, Bedford is changing and Bedford College decides to move out and to move to Marylebone further north, okay? And the next, I want to show you this, I thought Ed would like to see this because this is the most recent lease that is in the archive at the Woburn Estate, 1920. You see how it's almost completely got built up. There are just two little areas there. And, but also 
notice that it's to an institute, an institute of builders. It's no longer uh, a private residence. So that just to finish off on Bedford Square from the Woburn Estate. So Claire. Yes, I think we're on to the next slide. Um, and here we are back um, at the, the dusty, dirty front of 1912. Um, I think, and, and now home to Mags, and uh, it's really a great privilege, I, I would say, to be back here today. Um, and a point I made earlier, I think having a sense of place, belonging, mm. having a building, was always important to the college. And I know that we, uh, all of us here, I'm sure, felt that very strongly about Regent's Park, about college and uh, the main building in Regent's Park, but the home, um, St. John's, where we were. I was a student, history student, Caroline taught me. Um, and we felt very strongly, we felt very rooted there, sense of place was important. Um, or, or Linsel Hall, whether you were a, a resident in Linsel Hall or Reed Hall or Hanover Lodge, um, all of those places were important and I'm sure we've all got vivid memories of them. And I think we were very fortunate that um, Elizabeth Jessa Reed had the money um, to found the college and had the money to take the lease of this house in Bedford Square in Bloomsbury. And in Bloomsbury at that time, and the Bloomsbury of that time was really important to the founding of the college and to its flourishing in the early years. Um, Can I just say one thing which I forgot to say, wanted to say, which was that I've been reading um, Marion Tuke, is she called Marion Tuke? Margaret Tuke. Margaret Tuke's book on the history of Bedford College, one of those books you have on your shelves but never quite laid down to read. And I took it out to read. It's not an easy read. It's quite tedious, to be honest. <laughs> and it's all about, and this is, it made me think about it because it's all, she obviously read the material in the archives, the council minutes, the administrative records. She did not read what we've been looking at, the correspondence. It's, and her book is entirely about the administration and the way the college was run and which council and who quarreled with who and who, you know. What we've tried to do is to talk about the place, to think more about the context. She says nothing, I mean, about acquiring the lease or getting rid of the lease or what the bones like. That obviously just didn't interest her in 1939 when that book started. I mean, just interesting how we have different perspectives on the history of our college at different times. So we feel very strongly about this place, but I don't think she did. I think she was interested in how the college was run, but then she was the principal. So perhaps we should ask the principal to speak <laughs> and tell us how she feels about the way the college is run. Um, um, do you yes. want to have another slide before we've we got, do? Yes, we've, we've just got one more slide. Um, I think I am speaking to this slide, uh, both as a historian, as a, uh, a student of Caroline, as in fact many of us in this room were, um, but also as someone who's used the archive and actually someone who wrote one of the very early catalogues of the Bedford College archives when they were moved from Regent's Park to Royal Holloway. And um, uh, we are a dying society, necessarily. <laughs> um, there are no more students of Bedford College. We are, we are the last ones. Um, and I think our, the college will live on through the archives. And w the committee of the society, um, thinking about how we could preserve the spirit and the legacy of Bedford College into the future, I thought that for this year, perhaps our project, our, our push, our, um, uh, what we wanted to achieve from this year were well, several things to bring us all together, to celebrate, uh, to exchange memories, to see each other, but also to think about the college of the future. Um, we support the Bedford scholarships and we uh, each year we have a really good group of young scholars, um, students whom we support through the Bedford scholarships that uh, through uh, donations from, from Bedfordians. But we thought that for this year, perhaps we ought to think in the longer term and think about supporting the archives. Um, and on your seat, you'll find um, a, a, a sheet about the, um, the project, that the, the fundraising initiative. Please take that away and, and give it consideration. And you'll hear more about it um, during the year. But 
uh, please think about what you've heard today and the photographs that you've seen over um, in 11 Bedford Square. And if you are in a position to help, um, then please give it some thought. I, I, it, I, I know that the college would really value that. Because the archives, I mean, we both worked in the archives, are very fascinating, but um, a lot of Elizabeth Jessery's letters are not dated. Um, and with more work, one could get a better chronology of them, for example, and find out, put some more flesh on the bones of the story of the early history of the college. So I think the archives, I and mean, also, the, it's interesting that, shall we just say, that the Bedford archives are different from the Holloway archives. They are, um, Bedford had um, files on each student. Holloway has a sort of register, in, like a sort of school register with the names of the students and then some details about what happened to them later, like failed her degree or whatever it is. <laughs> uh, but, you know, so the, there's a tremendous difference, but the Bedford archives are much more voluminous mm. and they contain really interesting things about the people who taught at Bedford as well. I have, just to tell you, I had a friend who was very interested in somebody who taught at Bedford College, who was a writer and a poet, and he went and was very excited to read the trial on him because he taught briefly at Bedford in 1938-9, and it was all about his pension, and nothing, <laughs> and nothing, of, nothing about his, uh, anyway. Okay, so please support the archives because they really are a tremendous resource and need to be exploited more fully. Okay. Um, now so just... Yes, you, you make an appointment. I, I think you have to make an appointment. You can't just yeah. turn up. No. No. Um, before um, we move to drinks, I think um, the Vice Chancellor, Julie, Principal, uh, Julie Saunders would like to say something. It's, it's for me to be here today. It's an absolute delight. So, those of you who have already shared stories and um, your experiences, it, it's really appreciated. What many of you won't know about me is that my area of research, which is the 17th century, and loves archives and libraries is on literary geography. So place is really important to me. And you've heard from um, both her and, and Caroline about the resonance of being in this room is remarkable in this building. And my job today is to thank the person who's really made that possible, which is Ed Mags. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because this is a community and I, I know the legacy will be in the archives. The legacy is also in future students. It's in the social purpose. It's in the heart of Royal Holloway and Bedford New College. And, and I don't take that lightly. You don't take that lightly. And it's lovely to be with you all. Thank you. <laughs>